my presentation today will be uh, structured roughly in three parts. Uh, I will start with a brief genealogy of my encounter with rhythm in terms of foundational texts, but also foundational encounters with like-minded scholars and events that have helped me and contributed to shape my thinking and the development of my thinking um, in relation to rhythm and education. I will then move on to a second section where I will delve a bit deeper into the nature of rhythm and the challenges and complexities in defining what that is and how we can use it to then mobilize uh, mostly Lefebvre's ideas of rhythm analysis, to use it as a method, as a critique, and in particular as a pedagogy in higher education. The final section will be um, about offering a series of considerations and preliminary thinking, if you like, gesturing towards how we can uh, think of rhythm in different terms as we enter and as we navigate, again, the challenges and complexities of the hybrid post-pandemic university. So rhythmic encounters. To briefly say a few words about my background, I researched and I studied international relations and politics uh, in my previous life as an Italian scholar, to then move to uh, policy and politics and the sociology of higher education and the critical university studies field with an emphasis on um, critical political economy frameworks on the study uh, of higher education, which in a sense left me uh, wanting and you know, a lingering sense of frustration because they failed to capture the lived experience of those who actually make the life and the everyday life in the universities, uh, students and staff. Um, and, that's the, and that's the background that brings me to a chance encounter, which maybe is not so much of a chance encounter with rhythm analysis, which captures, captured my imagination and made me want to know more about how we can mobilize ideas about rhythm to talk about education. I mentioned a number of foundational texts that were absolutely key to uh, the development of my thinking and that I keep returning to. There is the work of Don Lyons in particular, what is rhythm analysis that uh, effectively uh, popularized uh, showcasing the different popularized rhythm analysis, showcasing a, a variety of experimental methods and the inventiveness of these, of these methods to capture rhythms in social sciences in different and across different disciplines such as sociology, but also human geography, uh, education, performance studies and more than that. Yi Chen's work on practicing rhythm analysis uh, introduced the idea of a philosophical debate uh, between and dialogue between rhythm analysis, um, phenomenology and materialism that is still uh, with me in many different in many different ways at different levels when I think about rhythm and I think about how to mobilize rhythm in education. And then um, the work of uh, Sue Middleton and Michelle Alhadek Jones, which both in different ways, but powerful ways, spotlighted the connection between rhythm and education and rhythm and critique and rhythm as form and dispossession that lately have been uh, responsible for, let's say, the slow but sure moving of my understanding of rhythm uh, away from the temporal understanding of it towards a much more, uh, if you like, ontological and ethical uh, interpretation connected with the idea of form and dispossession. I mentioned also a number of foundational events, uh, which also brought about the idea of building an international community of scholars. And, you know, Michelle, Pascal Michon, and Mike Neary were absolutely instrumental uh, to this. A number of seminars, among which the seminar series on rhythm analysis at Goldsmith College, organized by Paola Crespi and Sunil Mangani, were absolutely fundamental for the starting of my, let's say, rhythmic journey uh, through. Uh, different ways of theorizing rhythm. The Accelerated Academy Conference in Prague, where you know, my connection with Michel deepened, and so our projects to come together and come to a, um, and in a sense, mobilize different ideas about rhythm to create 
or resurrect some interest in a field of rhythm analysis and of rhythm studies. And then the symposium that I organized in Birmingham uh, in 2019, again, deepened the interest uh, and the fascination with different ideas surrounding rhythm. And then, of course, there is always a matter of rhythmic sensibility in the same way as Michelle. I have been traveling uh, between two different countries, uh, speaking two very different languages and being immersed in two different cultures for the best part of, uh, let's say, the past 16, 15, 16 years experiencing rhythmic difference and dissonance in, in, on many occasions, but also a new configuration of eurythmia and, and, and harmony between difference. I have always been fascinated and drawn to the effective dimension of localized temporalities, to the idea that where we are and when we are affect uh, what we can do in those spaces and times, and that has a particular relevance when we talk about the times and spaces of teaching and learning. That also um, gave the impulse to the idea uh, of a research that was meant to explore the rhythmic nature of education and is still meant to do that, uh, in, in intending education both as an institution and as a process of knowledge acquisition, of learning, of personal growth, and of navigation through the multiple crises that traverse both the educational journey and the existential journey. And finally, last but, but not least, I think, you know, I, I can speak on behalf of many different people if I say that the pandemic experience and, and you know, the personal uh, shock uh, and appending of my personal existential rhythm uh, when dealing with uh, my father's illness that had me moved back to Italy for about nine months and created an experience for me of radical uh, schizochrony or you know, the experience of a deep antagonistic uh, spatial temporal experience as I was physically in Italy and immersed in the moment of sickness and fear and, and care uh, for my father and at the same time connected virtually to the university and continuing my work uh, with the university but from a radically different uh, existential position. So all this as a background uh, explains why whether I want it or not I keep going back to rhythm and to the chasing of, of rhythm. And rhythm has uh, both the quality uh, that we can insti in instinctively recognize um, and that Lexi Eichelboom defined as this kind of periodic oscillation between strong and weak beats, uh, the repetitions, the visual patterns, the periodicity, something that can be measured and that grasps us and that we recognize as rhythm, for instance, in dance or in music. But that never, um, manages to uh, fully capture all that is involved with rhythm and what it means to be caught into a rhythm, to be getting into a rhythm, into a rhythm and to be getting out of that rhythm. And so we are engaged in, in or I am engaged in an attempt to uh, think rhythm or to promote rhythm thinking, uh, being aware of the dual aspect of these activities, which on one hand, involve the refinement and the experimentation to mobilize these ideas and transform rhythm into a conceptual tool and a methodological tool, tool to capture lived experiences in time and space. But at the same time, through this practice and experimentation as form of critical thought, um, rhythm thinking is a way to constantly approximate and nuance our understanding of rhythm as a subject of investigation. Fully aware of that kind of elusive and fugitive, ineffable nature of rhythm. Another difficulty with rhythm thinking, and in particular as a scholar, rhythm writing or talking about rhythm is captured very well in, in, in this fragment by Virginia Woolf. And she's not even talking directly about rhythm, she's talking about style of prose composition. She defines that kind of sight and emotion that creates the wave in the mind long before it makes words fit to it. And it is exactly like that. There is a form of pre-verbal 
uh, element, precognitive element to rhythm that is that kind of difficult to grasp but easy to sense quality to it. I think Vincent Barletta, with his work on rhythm as form and dispossession, uh, does a brilliant job in capturing, and I quote, that pre-verbal interaction between the self and the external world that, world that results in some form of internal displacement. It's about time, and we know that, uh, that the temporal element and dimension to rhythm is what makes it easier to approach to, but it's also about resonance, vitality, the body's broad, broad entrainment through percussion, a flex and rest duality that gives life and thus precedes cognition or even experience. So is, you know, in, in, in the most complex sense is for Balletta a matter of form. Not just that, a form giving internalized displacement. And at the heart of this tension, tension between this dual understanding of rhythm uh, is a dual <laughs> etymological or a polysemic uh, expanded interpretation of what rhythm means. If we go back to the Greek etymology of the term, we find that rhythmos for the pre-Socratic uh, atomist philosophers such as Democritus, but also uh, the poets uh, and the playwright, Aeschylus and Sophocles among others, rhythm uh, denoted uh, a configuration without fixity or without necessity a mutable, changeable form, a form of dispossession. And in that sense, this kind of definition privileges the spatial, the morphological, and the almost the ontological dimension of rhythm. To quote that kind of poetic fragment by Archilochus that ends this ver his verses with an invocation to the spirit to come to recognize the rhythm that holds us all. And so there is indeed a centripetal power, almost a gravitational field that makes us uh, sense rhythm in a way as always and already there, that has the ability to hold us and bend us in specific ways. And in that sense, it both gives us form and limits human agency, producing that sense of internal displacement or, or, or dis dispossession. But then there is rhythm in the meaning that can be found from Plato and Aristotle onwards, which gives that kind of mathematical foundation and numerical specificity um, that is familiar to us and, and uh, bring, brings us to think of rhythm as an embodied movement organized in time, as that kind of ordering movement that we recognize uh, through measure and, and meter and harmony in dance and in music. And here the emphasis is on the temporal aspect. So I argue that within this tension and within the richness that these two interpretation of rhythm holds, we can avoid uh, the philological dispute and avoid choosing uh, a camp, so to speak, and consider them together in, in, in a powerful complementarity to extend and expand our conceptualization of rhythm and to see what can be done whether, when we consider both rhythm and rhythmos in the analysis in my case, of universities and everyday life. The second part of, of this presentation is more about uh, how I used uh, ideas of rhythm that are drawn from the Febvre's rhythm analysis. Um, and in that sense, uh, rhythm analysis is concerned with the social production of, of time, time and space. And with this, within this broad sense of what we conceived to be the social spatial practice, the attention is on bodies in space, on patterns of activities and movements. Uh, once again, focusing on the mutual necessity of the spatial and the social of time and space and of place and space in the analysis of every day. And this is oriented to a clear sense of action and praxis as we appreciate the making and remaking of social practice, its, rep its repetition, and differences to think about the ways in which we can transform uh, the everyday life. And of course, rhythm analysis as a method of inquiry, as an orientation for research can be applied, as, uh, can be applied to a set of activities, physiological or, or, or psychological states, even things, uh, anything and everything on the assumption that these occurrences can be read and interpreted as rhythmic assemblages 
uh, bundles that can display, as we can see, harmonious qualities, like in the case of eurythmia, or can compose polyrhythmia, so a composition of diverse rhythm that are not in discord, or even, and most interestingly, for the purposes of this kind of analysis, to focus on the moment of rhythmic rupture, the kind of pathology and desynchronization and interruption of the flow that we find when we encounter the arrhythmic state. To talk about arrhythmia is an important entry point because arrhythmia with the fatal rupture of the flow forces us to do two things. One is to try and understand what has caused the interruption of the flow. And second, uh, to, you know, to, to enact some form of action to both redress, let's say the condition of pathology, if we take the metaphor and the reality of the kind of uh, illness as an example, as, a, as the example suggests, but also if we think politically about uh, the rupture in the flow and, and the interruption of a particular moment, we think about arrhythmia also as an opportunity to um, instigate a counter hegemonic rhythm. And I think in this case, for instance, at strikes, which are, you know, uh, on my mind these days as universities in England are about to start uh, striking and it's the biggest strike in the history of the sector where 150 universities in February and March will strike for better pay condition, work condition and, pension, um, and pensions among other things. And so this rupture, in the flow of the activities within the universities that will affect teaching and learning is designed to produce and to enact a counter hegemonic project. And so we start to see the political quality uh, of rhythm analysis uh, in the Lefebvrean term as a method and within the Lefebvrean meta philosophy, if we like, in the broadest sense, as a method that is designed to appropriate and transform the time spaces of the everyday. And when we talk about that kind of appropriation of space and time, we talk about what Lefebvre calls pedagogy, the radical pedagogy of appropriation and of creation of these kind of deviant counter spaces that show productive capacity revealing the breaking points of the everyday practices. Uh, and that also signal the points at which that counter space can become a revolutionary space full of enjoyment and hope. And that is in a sense what uh, drew me to rhythm analysis as a form of understanding and exploring the realities and the everyday life of teaching and learning in the institution. The kind of search for that appropriation of the times and spaces of education by students, by teachers, by researchers, by whoever is involved in the, in the actual life of the university. And you know, a few words about what I mean by what Lefebvre means uh, as a revolutionary action here is not so much the grand design of seizing political power or changing and transforming the economic relations and modes of production, Yes, of course, the critique, the critique of capitalism and the, uh, and, and, uh, and the Marxian analysis uh, of modernity and, and modern oppression are central concern for Lefebvre, but the, uh, the importance of the everyday as the site of struggle and of site of potential revolution happens uh, in the interstices uh, and in the cracks through which, you know, you know the, the, the kind of oppression uh, that, that dominates the life of human beings cannot be total, cannot be uh, achieved completely. And so it is through these cracks and interstices that the action and the potential change into the everyday uh, is affected um, by, in my case, teachers and learners. So mobilizing this idea, these philosophical ideas and also this um, practical insight uh, made me think about how to use the kind of reflexive dialogue between method, critique and object of social and political inquiry that Lefebvre so masterfully, um, so masterfully does in his work and look at it from the perspective of higher education institution and by proxy as well, uh, the idea of education itself. 
And that leads me to the experimental pilot project that I conducted at BCU in uh, 2017 and 18 in particular, which was uh, inspired, yes, by the work of Lefebvre, but also by uh, the beautifully written and performed rhythm analysis of the city, uh, Valparaiso in Chile, uh, that Mike Neary writes about in his Pedagogy in Paradise, which you know, I invite you all to, to, to read. It's, it's, it's in his blog. And methodologically, by the pioneering work of Dawn Lyons with her um, rhythm analysis of the Billingsgate fish market in London, where she introduces the extensive use of time-lapse photography to capture the rhythms and the essence of the activities in that uh, fish market. So in an attempt to capture the articulation of my participants' experiences of teaching and learning um, unfolding in the physical spaces and times of their everyday life within the, within the university, I decided to uh, use time-lapse photography to capture um, the three different campuses of, of my university, which are located in, very, in, in three very different locations. One in city centre, uh, so at the heart of the pulsing heart of the city of Birmingham. One in city south, in a leafy green suburb uh, called Edgebaston. And one in city north, Paribas, which is no longer in existence. And that at the time of um, the project, uh, five years ago, was about to be decommissioned and dismantled. The idea and the intuition was that three, these three different locations and the people uh, and, and in terms of staff and students working in, in these three different locations were uh, affected in very different ways by the pace of activities, the atmospheres and the type of work uh, that they were able to do and perform in these places. So I interviewed uh, 18 participants, members of nine members of staff and nine students across the three faculties, the three sites and eight disciplinary fields, um, asking them, accompanying them in walking interviews where I asked them to wear a GoPro camera uh, and I asked them to take me on a journey on the campus to tell me uh, where were the meaningful spaces for the uh, learning and experiences uh, and also the experiences of time that emerged in follow-up interviews after the walking interview. Uh, so what I will show you, I'll show you in a second is a few extracts from uh, what resulted from this, from this project. Um, what you will see now is are fragments of the time-lapse photography that captures uh, the external, uh, the main entrance of the three campuses, and the, um, and the view on the library of the three campuses. And what you will see, and then also um, what happens inside classrooms in two different locations to capture a sense of those activities at that time, which you know, I don't need to remind you, it was, it was pre-COVID uh, and so pre-rupture, uh, pre so to speak. The, what I want you to pay attention to essentially is um, the contrasting experience of the campuses in city, north, city uh, center and, and, and city south with uh, the campus of city north, which at that point was about to be abandoned and had, for this reason, very different, uh, displayed very different rhythms and paces of activity.
Now, from these classes bustling with activities and the relationship, the intense exchange in space between tutors and students, you know, teacher educators and their teaching teacher trainees, and the uh, snapshot views that captured uh, that captured the pace of activities in the atmosphere in three different locations that make up one space actually, of the university. We move to a little extract, the final part of one of the walking interviews with the senior lecturer in sociology, that at the end of the interview um, takes me to the fire escape stairs in city centre campus, which it's the uh, busiest, most crowded uh, space. And the discussion here is about collapsing of boundaries between teachers and students, the type of buildings that uh, modern educational institutions in England, post-92 teaching, uh, teaching intensive institutions, um, uh, the, the ways in which they are constructed and built to enable certain type of work, but also to inhibit uh, what the participant called that kind of time for autonomous, quiet reflection that he comes and find, uh, ironically, on these stairs. I bar the old, the old place and other institutions that I've worked at, say Sussex, uh, were more campus universities, not necessarily removed from a city campus. Sussex was very much so. So almost it was symbolically kind of physically removed yeah. from the, the busyness of the city or whatever. So it's a kind of reflective space in itself. Yeah. But within the campus, there were lots of sort of, particularly yeah. outdoor spaces actually that could be used collectively or place to sit and read that again were yeah about boundaries between sort of autonomous reflection and kind of collective getting together and sort of sociability so there's that element i think and here feels less like that it, maybe these new buildings are starting to develop it but it sometimes feels as though you're in the building then you step outside and you're in birmingham whereas other places would be you step outside and, and you're in the campus and there's still that kind of also the nature of the architecture of the building made the observation that the only, um, the only reason why she knows she's in a university is because the students are there. Yes. Yeah. That take the students out and this is not a place that you would think of is. Yeah. It could be university. another large organisation. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, the other boundaries that's particularly important to me, I think, that, that's coming out of this actually as I've been speaking, is that I do see this as a collective social space in lots of ways where those pockets for sort of autonomous reflection that are important to the job aren't, you don't find them here. Yeah. I might find my little places to go and, you know, you know, find some space upstairs or be stairs, but for the most part, I now have a real separation between home and work. Yeah. And home is autonomous, thoughtful, reflective space. Mm. And here is, you know, social, pragmatic, getting the job done, but that's yeah, lost. Okay. My, my usage of quiet reflective spaces are usually to get away from the business. So the reason I brought you to these stairs is that I know if I want to move, particularly at close to and um, close to the hour when lectures might be pulling out, I could you know leave my office and go down the main stairs, just dodging everybody and moving around. Nobody uses these or yeah. even knows they're here. So I've said to students before, oh, we'll just go this way. And they'd say, I don't even know these were here, almost like they're fire escapes, which yeah. they are. But it's also, you know, from, you know, all the way down to, you know, all the way up, you know, it takes you top to bottom of the building. Yeah. It's a quick way to get from A to B. And actually it is, you, you can, you feel like you can kind of close that door. Oh, and there's no one. And you can sort of move, move up and down. Yeah. I mean, I don't, don't stand around in here. Although I do occasionally, which is quite interesting. Um, I'll be wandering past and there will be a Muslim student um, sort of praying here, yeah. using this as a space. Yeah, which is quite interesting because again, there's probably parallels there between the sort of kind of reflective, sort of sacred space almost, and what would be my reflective sacred space. Yes. 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 Yeah. So on on one of these floors, yeah. it'll be a space for students to come out and and pray. Um, but again, interesting. Again, that these quiet spaces. Quiet. That and I suppose in many senses 
my quiet spaces for reflection, not necessarily in the same sort of uh, religious way, but no, are really important. General, yeah. And it's important to have those have those spaces. Hey, bar the old. So <laughs> we are a long way from that discussion about um, separation between home and work. Uh, fast forward and we are in the pandemic um, with the collapse of the campus and the collapse uh, of the separation in terms of space for work, space for reflection and space for life and space for family and space for downtime, uh, leisure time as Lefebvre would call it. Um, but we then fast forward it again and we find ourselves in um, what emerges out of that digitization, radical uh, digitiza digitization of educational spaces that happened out of necessity during, during the pandemic. So the question becomes here about thinking um, of two things, I guess. One, whether um, these kind of pedagogy of appropriation of time spaces is, is still relevant um, when, we, when we navigate different types of spaces, spaces that five years ago were not present and not dominant, the online, the digital space, uh, as you know, all these kind of little videos uh, that I showed you demonstrated. Back then, the kind of revolutionary act was an attempt to find within the campus and within those buildings, within the conceived spaces of those buildings, um, a revolutionary, a deviant, a counter space for thinking. And right now, I think um, the thought needs to be developed in terms of which kind of spaces we want to inhabit, whether they are uh, online or offline. So we are presented in a sense with a choice, but um, this choice happens in a, in a context that has seen uh, an intensification of crises, multiple crises, intersecting and interlocked crises uh, that the university reflects and, and, and magnifies. You know, we, we, we went from, from COVID to the war in Ukraine, the energetic crisis, the cost of living, cri cost of living crisis, the unfolding cri climate catastrophe. All of this, in a sense, makes the, uh, the idea and, and the, the definition of the Gramscian interregnum, where the old, old social order is dying and the new cannot be born, um, a very concrete reality as we uh, experience uh, the processuality, the organic nature of this crisis, and all the kind of uh, morbid symptoms uh, that accompany it. So as I said, uh, the university itself is part of this crisis, and the university is also facing uh, a crisis, a, a much deeper crisis that has a lot to do with, with its own DNA and its own uh, foundation. Um, that are more and more, uh, and rightfully so, called into question as a, as, a, as a capitalist, as a patriarchal, as a colonial institution, um, is, is in a sense uh, being questioned and being asked to rethink, uh, rethink the purposes, um, which I, I, in a sense, see as a renegotiation of its rhythms of existence. And it's the context of, the, of this hybridity with its very mutable, if not volatile context, I think that makes the necessity of talking about the choice of rhythms and the choice of uh, the changing forms of education all the more important. And here I am reminded actually quite vividly of that kind of fantasy of the ideal with me uh, that Barthes introduces in, in, in his lectures at the College of France, How to Live Together, uh, where he talks about the, 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 the importance of choosing one's own rhythm and living by it, uh, but at the same time, how to <laughs> negotiate the, the, the choice and imposition of our own rhythm with the fact that we ought to live together. And in a sense, when we think about our lives in, in universities and our uh, coexisting 
very often jarring rhythms of existence in offline and online spaces. We need to raise it as an explicitly ethical concern, as whether we know it or not, whether we are aware or not, we are every day pondering choices about the degrees of conjunction, as Bifo Berardi calls that kind of living together as bodies in space, the degrees of our connection online or hyper-connection and the degrees of separation. And so both Barthes and Lefebvre offers us that kind, that, that the kind of powerful vignette of scene from the window. Uh, Lefebvre was looking at Paris, at the streets of Paris, at the monster of capital uh, represented by uh, the Centre Pompidou um, that was literally swallowing up people uh, and pushing them out uh, in, in, in uh, repeating waves throughout the day. And Bart sees from the window a scene of a mother and a son, a mother pushing an empty stroller and dragging along a recalcitrant son that refuses to be absorbed in the rhythm uh, and within the rhythm of the mother. And so that kind of idea about the uh, rhythms at odds of mother and son became to me as a form of uh, allegory of the different rhythms and the different time and spaces that we are now called to inhabit in the university. I don't know who's the mother and who's the son and who's dragging whom in this case, but what is clear is that um, from a political uh, from a political stake, we move towards a much more strongly uh, clear ethical uh, aesthetic. In the words of Sumil Mangani that expresses it very, very eloquently, uh, this kind of ethical aesthetic that is at stake questions our responsibility to form more so than needing to declare particular political positions. So the scene of the mother and child reminds us of the unruly nature of rhythm. And while the scene does not depict so much a form of knowledge, but the relational production of forces, what emerges is an aesthetic production of ethics. And again, Barth's account of ideorhythmy is a reminder of the choices that rhythm presents us with, and that our engagement is not so much a matter of knowledge, but leads to forms of practice and production. And this is for me a key, key passage, because what differentiate um, the rhythms of existence in the university uh, now, as opposed to the pandemic time and the previous, the pre-pandemic times, is a choice that we are faced with every day between these kind of spaces and how to partake and when to partake in these rhythms. For instance, what do we make and what do we do with the digital spaces? Do we consider them as contemporary equivalents to Lefebvrean balconies, where it's up to us whether we want to stay inside or outside, whether with a click we can connect through particular rhythms, but also at the same time be physically part of other rhythms. So in a sense to me, it's the return of rhythmos of the post-pandemic university with a vengeance, as the notion of a shifting configuration of a moving form uh, when we consider the mutable forms and the many flows and stoppages that the coexistence of online and off offline spaces presents us with um, demands us to think of forms of education that I that I think are more um, apt to uh, define and explore uh, the changing configuration. It's also, it also demands us to think about what's still there and what connects us all, the rhythm that holds us all, no matter what, within the university and that stayed true of the pre-pandemic, the pandemic and the post-pandemic. And I see it as still a moving, uh, shifting force field uh, where bounded by intellectual conversations, but also more so than ever by personal stories, personal histories, meaningful connections that are stubbornly thought, uh, sought while moving across digital and physical space times, demanding you know, a lot of effort and a lot of energy uh, of us, but also 
uh, reminding us of the renewed importance, which I think emerged during pandemic time, of voice and listening um, as distinctly human, ethical, careful practices, very intimate practices with haptic qualities. And this invitation to listen in particular is, I think, one of the traits that um, will stay with us in, 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 in the future development uh, of the shifting configuration of the hybrid spaces in the university. And so as I see, as I see it now, the biggest challenge for us is to take on the responsibility of form giving, as I was mentioning at the beginning when I was talking about that kind of ineffable element to dimension to rhythm, that form giving and turn it into the anticipatory practice of temporal imagination. After all, as Lefebvre says, it behooves metaphilosophical thought to imagine and propose new forms, or rather a new style that can construct itself practically and realize the philosophical project by metamorphosizing the everyday. Of course, he uh, uh, mobilizes the, 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 the magic encounter of praxis, poiesis, and mimesis uh, to enact this kind of um, project, ultimate project of overcoming philosophy. And so we are, in a sense, torn between, uh, well, a number of choices. One could be uh, the one, for instance, represented by uh, Jan Maschlein as a philosopher of education that invites us to uh, think of pedagogical forms as concrete examples of, of a pedagogical life and of a reclaiming of the university as a res pedagogica, as a thing that protects and nurture public and collective study going back to inhabiting those, uh, those spaces, for instance, you know, the campus university, because these pedagogical forms are seen as awakening and animating experiences. Those experiences that only the kind of conjunction and conspiration of bodies in a place can give us, as they can give us the sense that the world is speaking to us as we give birth to knowledge. These pedagogical forms need to be adventurous in spirit, not in a grand and spectacular way, but in the simple yet crucial sense that there is no predetermined destination nor path, for the path of formation appears while walking it. With time, crucially, this is uh, uh, taken from Mashlen Valedictory Lecture, titled With Time. And so this pedagogical form creates a certain kind of time for the world to better perceive what matters and hear the world. And again, there is a return to, to the, the intimate act of listening, listening in and listening out to then develop a plurality of voices. Or we could uh, develop and explore uh, forms of educational experiences that exceed, that go beyond what uh, Emile Boyesen calls intentional education, formal education, institutional education. And of course, this is inscribed in a, in, in a critique of the humanist legacy to education. And we need to see the value of an educational experiences of an in excess that, te that tells us that education is the perpetual formation and deformation of non-stable subjects. And I want to conclude with a tribute to uh, Mike Neary, uh, who recently passed away, um, remembering for his fierce intellect, his generosity, uh, his you know, kindness of soul as a and his role as a mentor and as a good friend of mine. From Pedagogy in Paradise, he talks about dereliction. He connects very powerful through rhythm analysis uh, earthquakes, physical earthquakes and catastrophes to uh, the catastrophes, the catastrophes of, of political violence. He's talking about Chile, but he is, he's writing this in 2015 and, this, and, and, and he is incredibly prescient uh, when we think about the times that we live in now. And the, 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 the thought that I want you to, uh, to hold and to consider is this idea that the intersection and the dereliction caused by the friction between social rhythms and natural rhythm, uh, even though and precisely because uh, generates entropic processes, 
means that from out of this antagonistic unit between the natural and the social rhythms comes the capacity for another form of existence to be imagined. This is what Lefebvre defined as the thought of metamorphosis, the moment when contradiction is assuaged by the glimpse of a sustaining life which appears in the form of appropriated time. And citing Lefebvre from, from Mike Neary, a time that forgets time, during which time no longer counts and is no longer counted. It arrives or emerges when an activity brings plentitude, whether this activity be banal, an occupation, a piece of work, subtle, like a meditation contemplation, spontaneous, like a child's game or even one for adults, or sophisticated. This activity is in harmony with itself and with the world. It has several traits of self-creation or of a gift rather than an obligation or an imposition come from without. It is in time, it is a time, but does not reflect on it. And with that, I'll stop and I'll thank you very much for the sustained attention. <laughs>